Okay. So um, again, to introduce Maria from MCPS, who um, perhaps you could just introduce yourself a little bit. Sure. And Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being on the call today in the middle of the day. I'm Maria Tarsic, and I'm a director in our pre-K-12 curriculum office. So I help all of our support, all of our content area teams, like the math and the foreign language, world languages, literacy teams, all of that. So that's the role that I have. <clears throat> so I am going to talk to you today about the homework policy. And we're going to do this in a couple of different ways. I do have some information to share with you. Um, but I'm also going to give you a chance to, to get together in some smaller groups and kind of talk through some of your ideas and the things that you believe about homework, what it should be, what it shouldn't be. Then at the end of the presentation, we have a survey where you'll be able to give individual feedback about your own beliefs and thoughts about what should and shouldn't be a part of homework and how it should be used. So that's sort of the flow that we're going to go through. Let me go ahead and I'm going to share my screen and this will... In just a moment and get my little presentation up here. There we go. And before I get too far, I want to first let you know that like so many of you too, I'm sure I am battling allergies. And so I have a bit of a cough. So I'm good. I've got my bag of cough drops next to me and my hot tea in my hands. So if I start to uh, cough a little bit, I apologize and I'll try to mute myself as best I can. <clears throat> So to get your, um, as I said, we're going to do a couple of different things as we go through this discussion with time at the end to actually get your individual feedback. But to get your kind of thoughts flowing and to hear uh, from one another and get to meet who's in the room a little bit, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. And what that means is that you're going to be kind of moved into a smaller setting, still on Zoom, obviously, with um, how many people, maybe three or four other people. And when you go into those rooms, you'll be moved in automatically. Take a minute to introduce yourselves and then talk about these two questions. What do you think that the purpose of homework has been? And you might think about the experiences of yourself as a student and also the experiences of your children, your own students, and what you think from what you've seen from what's come home from MCPS, what do you think the purpose is? And then what do you think the purpose should be? And this might be the same answer for both questions or it might not, but I want to just kind of get your thinking going around your experiences about what homework is like for students and what you might uh, want it to be. So I am going to go ahead and create a couple of breakout rooms. Let's see, four, we do five, that'll be good. And... And I'll give you how about five minutes just to introduce yourselves and have a little bit of a conversation. And then you will um, automatically come right back to the whole group once that time is up. Let me. Wait, Maria, are we supposed to like re record our answers or? Just a conversation right now. Okay. Yep. So I believe folks are heading out to the rooms now. You might have something pop up on your screen that asks you to join. And if you need help, just let me know, I can move you. Leslie, Dolores, do you need help moving to your rooms?
Maria, do you want to pause the recording? Everybody back. Great. And we are recording again. Awesome. So hope you had a good conversation there and kind of heard some different perspectives. If you'd like to in the chat, if you want to just kind of flood the chat with anything that you heard that really stood out to you um, about what the purpose of homework should be or purposes, it could be more than one thing, certainly too. So go ahead and just drop anything to the chat that uh, kind of resonated with you and your group about what the purpose of homework should be. And we'll see what comes in. Gaining expertise in a topic. I see that from many. Reinforcing the topics taught in class. Repetition to build fluency. Practice independent study. Great. Reinforcement, extending learning. The habits for studying for college days. Yeah, yeah. These are all great. Skill practice. Yep. See a lot of the, some of the same ideas come in. It looks like uh, several of the groups had some similar conversations. So that's great. So hold on to those thinking. That'll be a question that we ask you in the survey at the end about what you believe the purpose or purposes should be. Before we get any further into our discussion, though, I do want to give a little bit of background about policy IKB and what uh, this process is that the school system is engaging in right now around policy. So first, a point of clarification. Within the school system, we are governed by two distinct things. There's policy and there's also regulation. Policy really sits on top of regulation. Policy is the higher level statement of principles and priorities. It really lays out the beliefs that the school system has around a particular topic. So in our case now, we're revising policy. So we're taking a look at what many years ago the board said, this is what we believe about homework and what it should be. And we're taking a look at that to see, is there something different that we, is, has anything changed in our beliefs? Is there something that we wanna state differently or add to that really lays out what our, our beliefs are around policy? And that's something that the Board of Education um, uh, approves and it belongs to them. They set policy. Regulation, however, gets more into the nitty gritty details. Once we have a policy that says, this is what we believe about homework, excuse me, then we're able to revise regulation if we need to. And the regulation is going to get into the more kind of um, specific processes or expectations at a more specific level that, that would affect a student's experiences. And these are controlled more by the superintendent. So a policy gets lots of public comment. It gets, there's a whole year long process that it goes through almost and from the beginning of its revision process all the way till a new policy is adopted. Regulation doesn't have to go through quite that same lengthy sort of process, but regulation um, flows out of what the policy establishes, okay? So that's the difference. And you might be wondering, why are we bothering to revise the homework policy? Homework is homework, right? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is that the last policy was revised in 1986. So we are in a very different um, place, not only post-COVID, but even prior to then. A lot has happened in, in our school system since 86. So it seems like probably ought to take a look at that policy and make sure either that it's still, we're still in agreement with it, or maybe there's some things that we want to update. We also know from the anti-racist audit um, that not all of our students experience homework in the same way, whether it's in the amount of homework they get or what is done with the homework, or how much it counts for, the um, feedback that they get, and even just the communication with families about homework. We we really saw in the, in the audit concerns about um, not just homework, but even instruction and curriculum with homework being a part of that 
that got raised. So we want to make sure that we're taking a look uh, <laughs> again at our practices and policy to make sure is there anything that we need to, to do better with. And then finally, since post-COVID, um, you all have seen the headlines. Um, you are living the reality of the increased mental health needs of our students. And so, again, we want to take a look at our homework policy. And homework is something that affects students and families almost every single day. It's one of the most visible ways that families interact with the school system. And so knowing that our students today are in a different place than they were in 1986, it might lend itself to thinking a little bit differently about homework and making sure that it is serving all of our students in the best way possible. There are four guiding questions that are um, guiding our thinking and development of possible policy revisions. The first one is the question that you just tackled around the purpose of homework. The next two questions are ones that we're going to put you in some breakout groups in a little bit and um, have you tackle these two questions around what homework practices are most impactful on students and which ones may impact our historically marginalized communities the most. So our African-American, Hispanic, um, emergent multilingual learners, our farm students for the free and reduced meal students um, who may struggle in poverty, our special education students, you know, really thinking about what's the impact on them as well. And then finally, the responsibilities of the district and the schools. Um, who, um, who sets those expectations? Um, so school by school decisions and what element of that can schools control and what is it? what are the expectations that as a district we need to set for everybody? So here you see on the screen several quotes from the anti-racist audit. And I just wanted to highlight a few of them. I know I spoke to it and said that there were concerns that were raised, but I wanted you to actually see some of the quotes that came in. And while not all of them are specifically about homework, several of them are um, really speak to that relationship between home families and school systems and the, and the communication. So you can see here one quote, parents don't know where to look to find messages about homework. So there's a consistency and a transparency concern there. Another question, another comment was that there's little to no outreach from many teachers. And then another one says, what are we going to do differently? This one specifically, even though it wasn't specifically about homework, is just raising the concern that we've got to do something different. We can't keep doing what we've always done and expect a different result. And really, the last uh, quote there is really, you know, calling MCPS to task to say, you need to do something. You need to make these. Um, outcomes for students, equitable, and taking a look at homework is just one of those areas that we know we need to do that. Okay, our timeline. <clears throat> so in uh, the spring, the framework in the board policy committee, this was a uh, board presentation a couple of months ago, just to let the board know what our plan was for revising the policy. That's already happened. We can cross that one off. The next um, item on the timeline in blue there, spring, stakeholder input research benchmarking. That's what we're doing right now. So we're getting stakeholder input from lots of families, from teachers, from administrators, different groups, students as well. We'll be doing research on what does the current research say about best practices for homework, and also taking a look at what are other districts that are similar to us across the nation? What are they doing? What are their homework policies? And see if there's anything there that we might want to replicate. Then in the summer, we will start drafting some revisions to that policy, um, making sure that the policy truly reflects the beliefs, the principles that our community believes in, not just central office staff, but certainly the broader community as well. And then in the fall, we go back to the board, we share our draft new policy, the board gives us feedback, and then we have another opportunity for lots of public comment on the actual drafted revision. So right now we're just in this blue section. I am going to, oops, stop sharing for a moment. Uh, there we go. Okay, learning my own way here. So before we go into groups and give you a chance to talk with one another again, I just want to uh, see if there's any questions about our process or the approach that we're taking with revising the homework policy. 
you're welcome to raise your hand or come off of mute or drop something in the chat if you have any questions. Regarding equity. I Minnie? So, yes. So regarding equity, mm -hmm. um, the anti-racism audit was showing that you can't find homework in specific places. Is this one of the reasons why there's so little homework given to the students in elementary school and in middle school? The, do you mean in response to the equity audit? Yes. Mm -hmm. Following the pandemic, our guidance to schools has consistently been to ensure that the social emotional health of our students is being protected as well as supporting the academic rigor that we want. And so I would say that coming off of the pandemic in particular, many schools have eased back on homework in order to not overwhelm students, to take attention to that, and really just focusing in and making sure that the homework that is assigned is really meaningful. And that certainly has been our message all, all along, that homework that is assigned needs to be meaningful. It can't just be busy work. It can't just be, um, you know, just because we've always done it that way. Okay, thank you. And Tiffany, I see your hand up. Hi there. Um, when you talk about benchmarking, are mm -hmm. you guys also considering, um, and you mentioned kind of similar school systems, are you also looking at private schools and what um, best practices are being done at independent schools and how those outcomes are being measured as well? That's a great suggestion, Tiffany, and I honestly had not thought of that, so I'm going to write that one down and make sure that that is part of our process, too. Thank you. Evelyn? Oh, um, just because I asked a question before the recording began, um, how, because of the, the, this came out of anti-racist audit, how are you going to be able to reach out to groups that you might not normally hear from. And um, I know in our Zoom, we were unable to get a translator in time. That's mm -hmm. on us, um, you know, recording it. It'll we have subtitles in YouTube, um, but we would be interested in trying to do more sessions in different languages. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you're doing as part of this initial process? Yeah, some of the other groups that we're reaching out to um, do represent um, some of our community members who do speak other languages. Um, particularly our Hispanic community. And so working with them, we're able to set up opportunities with translation, but we would love to work with you, Evelyn, as well, um, to do some more of these and be able to line up some translation. Okay, great. We have, mm -hmm. a, a, we hear a lot in the PTAs of the need for Amharic. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, and also we also, there's a large Chinese speaking population yep. as well. Um, and so one more uh, question, just are, are you also going to be looking at grading and reporting because the two are connected, like how homework is graded and reported. One comment I have heard from teachers is the difficulty these days in getting students to do um, homework, which is uh, makes things very hard, especially at the math classes um, mm -hmm. in terms of moving, getting the kids moving forward. And, you know, they've talked about the open deadlines making things a little hard to make sure that students are actually on pace because if the mm -hmm. deadline is left open for too long, um, is that gonna be part of your review as well? Yes, yeah, so the grading and reporting is a is a whole nother policy in regulation. So we're not looking at that to make changes, but you're absolutely right. The two are very connected. And so while we're not gonna be actively making changes there through this process, we are gonna be considering and talking about all of those implications as well. So it's part of the conversation, if not part of the final product. That makes okay. sense. Thank you. Leslie? Hi. Um, given that it's sometimes different disciplines have different needs, is this policy expected to sort of have like a blanket expectation for all disciplines or will curriculum specialists be able to sort of have input as to what their specific discipline actually needs um, is my first question. And then I have a second one. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I told you I have my cough. Um, so that is a great question. So the way I see that playing out is that policy may, the policy may state that in better language than this, but we'll state one size does not fit all. 
but in the regulation is where it might parse out those differences, such as a difference between elementary, middle, and high school expectations, or math expectations versus another content area. Um, so that's really the regulation details, but in the policy, we would say, if we were to agree that this is our belief that it should not be one size fits all, that's laid out in the policy. Okay. Um, and then my second question is, it's like interesting to me that it's like framed as belief and we're getting opinions. And at the same time, there is a lot of research on equitable homework practices and will parents have access to sort of that body of research or the mm. specific research pieces that are being used. You may be able to tell I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher at an independent school, <laughs> actually. Um, so just knowing that that body of research is out there, I know I feel empowered as a teacher parent to access that and understand that and incorporate that into my perspective making. Mm -hmm. but if I'm a non-practitioner, then I may be going more off my own experience or my own personal beliefs, which I have personally found with parents can be contradictory to what the research actually says. Mm -hmm. Great. That's a great suggestion to make sure that we share those resources and what's guiding us. Thank you for that. Uh, Catherine. Hi, thank you for doing this. I um, am wondering if in the context of thinking through homework, is a flipped classroom model part of the conversation around how we even think about homework and what should be happening at home and what should be happening in the classroom? And if so, you know, there are obviously some sort of structural, you know, issues and impediments we need to think about in terms of people's access to, um, you know, online resources or online videos. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Great. It's um, interesting that you bring up the flipped classrooms. And for those who haven't heard of a flipped classroom, flipped classroom is where the, the students do a lot of their initial learning um, the day, like the day or the days before, kind of on their own. And then they bring that to the class. And so then in the classroom, they take what they've learned and are able to spend more time um, applying it in new situations or going deeper with it, but like the initial learning kind of happens ahead of time. Is that how you would understand it, Catherine? Well, I'm thinking even, I mean, I think the way I think about it when I've talked to, you know, middle school math teachers about it, for example, is that, you know, normally what happens is the math teacher lectures, this is mm -hmm. how this is how the quadratic equation works. And then the kids go home at night and do their math homeworks and, you know, math homework in isolation, right? right? Without a teacher there to necessarily talk to. And, you know, a flip classroom offers the benefit of, oh, I sit and watch the video at home. Maybe I take some notes, but then the classroom time is actually spent doing what we think of as homework, right? Like the classroom time yes. is mm -hmm. I'm working on the problems, maybe in collaboration with peers, the teacher's right there to ask a question. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering how much that model has become part of the conversation around, maybe that's less stressful to do it that way. Maybe mm -hmm. that's pedagogically more helpful to do it that way. Maybe that's better for math and science, but not for other mm -hmm. topics. But, um, you know, when I talk to teachers about it, I, I tend to hear more about it from math teachers who I think are intrigued about it as a way to lighten the load a bit and mm -hmm. help reduce stress and also be very present while the kids are doing what has normally been their homework, like right. their problem sets. Right, right. Right. And I think we will um, come across in our research study, you know, definitely be looking at that. It's a, it's, Something that's come up in some of these the other meetings that we've had around around policy, people have had some some thoughts around it. So interesting that you bring that up too, Jennifer. Thanks. And this is a little along. I think it's probably very along the lines of the question before. I just I'm a parent of a third grader. I have um, a, a twenty year old, so it's my second time around. I mostly want to just know that teachers and support personnel that are working with kids that study this and practice this um, are informing whatever uh, this policy is going to be. Yes, yes, we are um, definitely getting input from our teachers too, teachers and support staff, yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to take a quick look at the chat. Um, and see what some questions might be in there. 
Um, Teddy, I see the question from you about level setting the amount. So again, this may be something similar to the question about different content areas where the policy will lay out a belief around that. And then the regulation could potentially assign a, a specific amount, um, most likely is how that would play. But that certainly is part of the conversation. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again quickly and show you what our next step is. Here we go. So I'm going to uh, put you into breakout rooms again. And while you're in those rooms, you might um, choose to think about homework now from either an elementary or a secondary lens as you talk about this. Thinking about the two questions that are at the bottom of the screen. What homework practices would have a positive impact on each of these students and what homework practices should be avoided? So in the icebreaker in the, the first um, breakout room, you were really talking about your own uh, personal experiences and what you've observed with your own um, children around homework. So now I'm asking you to continue some conversations, but this time think about these types of students that are described here on the screen. Lizette, Samuel, Sina, Jordi, Maya, and Enzo. And they represent a range of students and the types of students that are found um, really in all in, in one classroom, even with one teacher. And so as you think about these profiles of students, think about the homework practices that would be positive for them and the ones that might be challenging for them. And so I think um, we'll maybe have, how are we doing on time, Evelyn? Um, it's 1236. Why don't we do about um, seven or eight minutes in breakout rooms, and then we'll pull you back. And I want to give you some time to complete um, the survey at the end, because I know sometimes in these meetings, if this, if uh, you, if you we don't take time to like do it right now, we might never get back to taking the survey. So I want to actually give you time to do that while you're here. Um, and as uh, I know, there's still another presentation with Tracy coming on too. So let me go ahead and get you into breakout rooms again. And I believe you'll go right back to the rooms that you were in before. There we go. Oh, Maria, um, will will we be able to show the slides? Other than if there's perhaps we could link them in the chat. Um, I think yeah, what I would need to do is clean them up a little bit because they've got a little bit of like notes and things for myself. Oh, okay. I might. I is it the same as what's in the CAC? I can link to the CAC one. Um. Yeah, it is. Okay. I mean, everyone in MCCPTA has it because I put them in my reports. So. Okay. <laughs> so it's, okay. I, we've gotten approval before from your higher upset. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Thanks for asking. And actually, you know what? We will need to let me, um, let me, oh, geez. Pull up my show again. Now you're looking at an article that, uh, was dropped in the chat. I was taking a look at that while you guys were in your rooms. Okay, so you're back to here. So now um, you've had a chance, like I said, to talk a little bit about the, the purpose and the impacts. And so we're ready to get your feedback, um, your independent feedback on the survey. And so what I'm gonna do is um, drop this into the chat. So you have access to the survey. And Evelyn, I'm gonna ask your advice on a point of process here. We can go ahead, this concludes um, my portion of the homework policy. We can roll right into Tracy sharing about the curriculum or do you wanna give folks, you know, five, 10 minutes to complete the survey or what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I don't know. Did people? 
Uh, do people have any additional questions or comments they just wanted to raise? I'll wish all here. Sure. Yes, I think you can complete the survey later. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I think I think sometimes it helps people to hear other people's questions and comments. So sure. Um, sure. I just me... want to make sure. See, if, I can't see my gallery view. Let me just make sure. Let me see if it, whose hand is raised. Let me stop my share again. We can take questions, and uh, and then we'll turn things over to Tracy. Just make sure you grab that link. Um, it'll be in the slides when those get shared out. Um, but you can also just kind of open the link and set it. You know, set the tab to the side for now. Okay. Um, I'm not sure who was first, Minnie or Tiffany. Um, yeah, I'll take a shot at it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so what are the solutions presently being offered to adapt to every single demographic? I, the student who has to teach, who has to take care of kids at home, the student who is fall, fell behind by two months because of uh, family issues, things of that nature, and students with ADHD who have difficulty studying on independently. What are the solutions presently being offered instead of just no homework? Right. So all of those um, supports that students need that are happening in the classroom, teachers also take those into account for students as the homework goes home as well. So students who may need some scaffold, some support um, with even the in-classroom work, the teachers make sure that the homework that goes home has those supports available as well to the best that they're able. Or certainly it is more difficult when a student doesn't have, you know, a teacher right by them to help them navigate through some of those things. But it definitely is something that they take into account as they're assigning homework. So when we were growing up, we had a homework hotline. So that's not mm -hmm. available anymore. That was like 40 years ago. <laughs> that is a good question. I actually don't know if we still have the homework hotline. I know we did a number of years ago, but I am not sure that it's still available. We do have, um, we've had um, tutoring services since the pandemic, and I know there's some changes going on, on with that now too, um, but that is one of the other resources that we've had for students. There's certainly much more available online for support too. Uh, there was no Khan Academy when I was going through school to help with my homework, that's for sure. Um, Tiffany? Yeah, so I think we had a couple of um, good discussions or topics that came up in our group. And um, in one instance, um, I think we had a question um, around the racial piece, like what for context and background, we, we didn't know, we understand how different demographics and situations impact a person's ability to um, engage with you know, additional work. But what does the race piece mm -hmm. have to do with homework? So that's one question. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second piece is from, you know, there are different industries that we can learn from because really we're talking about an improvement science kind of thing from, from what I'm seeing. And in the healthcare space, the there are interventions that are done for the hard to reach under represented, you know, kind of populations that are not able to meet certain measures or metrics, right? In your work, are you guys looking at other um, industries where improvement science practices are being implemented and gaps are being closed um, for, you know, hard to reach or underperforming populations versus impacting the entire system? Mm -hmm. Good questions. So your first one around how does race impact homework? Um, that's probably a doctoral dissertation to fully answer that question. Um, but one of the ways that we've seen it impact is not necessarily, um, not just in what the um, lived experience in the environments of students may be when they take homework home, but also in how teachers interact with their students. So one of the things that we, we don't want to see as a district is that some schools have based their homework policies or practices rather on, on a belief that the students in their school just can't handle it. That's low expectations. 
that's not um, supporting students. It's making decisions for them that they can only achieve so much. So we're not going to give them any homework because we don't believe they can handle it. Whereas another school has a different set of beliefs because they believe the students in their school need more, you know? And so as part of the district's commitment to equitable instruction and equitable learning, it's making sure that our expectations for all students, regardless of zip code, regardless of demographics, we have those same high expectations. And people make decisions with the best of intentions, but it often doesn't always lead to the same types of outcomes that we want for all students. Um, your other comment around like learning from other businesses and other sectors, uh, you know, uh, use cases around making improvements, there's always so much that we can learn from other industries and in education. And it's not something that we always do. Um, educators often tend to, to feel like we are uh, unique and we are certainly <laughs> unique in, in the world of business. Um, but in that only educators can understand the work that we do, but that's just not true. We certainly can learn from other industries and other, you know, other efforts that have been made, particularly in the health industry around improvements and interventions and things like that. There are definitely some parallels there for how we approach our students in the impact of uh, race in those industries as well. I think there's many parallels there as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then, go ahead, so, Evelyn. Hi. So, just for folks who are going to be watching the recording too, um, in the breakout room, folks were asking what was already in the policy. So, we pulled it up for folks that are on the recording. Um, I will put the link in the chat and when I distribute the recording. Um, but it's pretty, pretty slim. <laughs> is, you know, are, is, a, is a policy that you guys are working on, like, is it going to get into more details? And, and sort of a related question is it does seem like it's left to the schools actually to decide on their homework policies. And so mm -hmm. um, are we thinking about something more central to make sure that it's more consistent across schools? Um, and are you also, you know, canvassing the schools to see what already their policy, existing policies are? Absolutely. Yeah. So that um, early in the presentation, I shared the four questions and that fourth question that um, we didn't put forward to the groups to discuss was exactly around that issue, around what is going to be left up to the schools to decide and what is going to be, what do we need to, um, to put forward as a district. Over the history of education, there has always been the shift in um, where decisions are made, school level to central office level, and at different times, kind of that power, if you will, has lived in different spaces. And so this is an opportunity for us to take a look at it and see, you know, we have left a lot up to schools to make their decisions for their communities. But now we're looking at some of that inconsistency across schools, and especially with our anti-racist, anti-bias lens now, we really need to look at that and say, is this best for all of our students, you know, and what needs to shift? And that starts with policy. That's great. I mean, just speaking for MCCPTA curriculum committee and all of our ed committees, as you know, like we are strongly and have been for years now, strong proponents of setting minimum standards and trying to keep consistency across the schools and across our districts. So we really um, hope that that's the direction that we're going in. And we applaud, you know, Dr. McKnight and the whole system for working on this. Um, I've seen some of the things that she's been saying and it's all like great news. Um, I hope that, you know, so you succeed in this. Um, and one just final note, just from MCCPTA, um, one thing that I did note in some of our survey responses was comments about um, and this is in the anti-racist audit about like the computer system, <laughs> continuing um, concerns about like the parent view and Canvas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I hope that's also, it's not really a policy thing, but as you're looking at homework, you're thinking about like the, um, what happens at the home, like what makes it easier and harder um, for, yeah. you know, families at home, um, all the computer issues and things like, um, you know, one thing that someone just mentioned to me because of our digital balance work was that parent view doesn't have capability to hear things like the voice capability so that people mm. who have um, difficulty reading things can also hear them voiced out. And right. that's sort of a tech fix, but um, it interplays into whether or not a parent's gonna be able to kind of keep track of yeah. their child's homework. So mm -hmm. um, oh, when I say, I had another hand up. Uh, All yeah. right, hi. Angela, last word for you. Um, okay. So I was wondering in the, 
in the process of schools making their own decisions about homework, are they expected to uh, survey the parents in the community in that decision, or are they just can make their decisions on their own? Mm -hmm. um, there is not a specific regulation, a rule, if you will, that they have to go make those decisions, certainly, you know, um, with full community input excuse me, but it certainly is a best practice. And I would absolutely hope that most the schools are doing that, whether it's through input from the MCCPTA or advisory groups with community involvement that they've set up um, to be able to do that. And I will say that um, while we're just talking about the homework policy, homework regulation, the district does provide um, to schools guidance around how to approach grading and reporting specifically uh, while homework is a part of that. And so even though like the policy is, you know, 30 years old, um, over 30 years old, I think, um, we have given guidance to the schools on best practices, on things that would be expected. Um, and certainly, if it's something that you're not seeing from the school that you're connected with, certainly um, the administration, I think, would welcome those conversations. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think the general feel, at least in my school, um, is that it doesn't seem that there's enough transparency about what's going on. So, for instance, even this, I have found out about this meeting through Miss Evelyn Chung, who has been amazing, uh, but she's at a school that my son goes to, which is a GT program. And I have two other children in our home school. And there's, there was no mention or word about these type of meetings. Uh, and so, you know, it would be nice to know kind of what is the policy uh, so that we understand what our rights are because we've had situations where the principals have said to us that they're going off of what the MCPS mm -hmm. has told them to do. And we've heard on the other side that they actually had the freedom to make their own decision. So we don't quite understand what that dynamic is between uh, principals, schools, and then the MCPS and Board of Education and whatnot, superintendents. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for elevating that. That concern around transparency and that we need to do better is resonates in pretty much every meeting that I'm in. It seems like it certainly came through in the audit. Okay, I think uh, I think Evelyn, we're ready to turn things over to Tracy. Great, and thank you so much, Maria. Um, I'm hopeful if folks have additional. Well, the survey's in the chat. Is there any? Should they? Who should they contact if they have additional questions? Or do you want they, them to contact? They can absolutely um, <laughs> or comment. Reach out to me, and um, I'm going to actually. Um, put another name in the chat. Um, full transparency, I am retiring at the end of this year. And so in a few weeks, I will no longer be receiving emails. So let me put another name in the chat here. Um, Angela McLean is, um, is helping to co-lead this work as well. So she would be a great person to reach out to. Best wishes, congratulations. And thank you, 30 years. Wow. <laughs> yep. Um, Okay, that's great. And I guess, so if people, because I know originally you didn't want me to just circulate the survey, but if people have watched this video, can, can they just input into the survey, having watched the video? Yes, uh, that would be fine. Um, right, we had shared, we were concerned about people completing the survey without kind of thinking about this, um, the equity lens and the equity questions and kind of understanding the background of what it's what's intended. I have to say that that's totally on point because I think I would have probably approached this different. This was very helpful in hearing from the other kind of uh, aspects and especially having a teacher, Miss Young. Uh, I think like, yeah, this was very, very helpful. I think we would all benefit from as many people hearing this and being a part of it as possible. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, there's a request before you go. Uh, Minnie, I think this is a good one, said to please put the equity scenarios into the survey. Mm, okay. That'd be great. I mean, yeah, because it's in the power. I'll circulate the PowerPoint as well, but mm -hmm. um, that way people specifically can think about it. 
Well, thank you again. And, and thank you for your service. 30 years. It's amazing. Um, you look too young, by the way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. 30 years. <laughs> Um, but but thank you again, um, and we really appreciate you joining us. Um, and now, uh, wait, I got it. I got it. A lot of people wanted to see the social studies. I've got to do my little text, and it's starting. <laughs> the um, now I'd like to introduce Tracy Oliver Gary, who's going to talk about the social studies curriculum changes um, and practices, changes and practices. So um, I give the floor over to you, Tracy. Thank you for coming as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, you gave me co-hosting, I believe, right? Oh, can you give me co-hosting privileges so I can share my screen? Perfect. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me so that I can talk about a subject that I absolutely love, and that is social studies. My name is Tracy Oliver Gary, and as Evelyn said, I'm the social studies supervisor. And before Maria became a director, she was the social studies supervisor and I was a social studies content specialist. So social studies, you know, like live, breathe, love it. So <laughs> I'm going to present, I'm going to um, share my screen now. Okay. Okay, I want to start off with a question, and this is a self-indulgent question, I, I will say, but I, I, want, I want to start off with this. Just, um, and you can unmute, you can place it in the chat. What's your reaction to the question, why is social studies needed? You can pop it in the chat, you can unmute. For community, for community, okay. Anybody else? For citizenship. Citizenship. Mm -hmm. For progress. Progress. Um, you want to ex explain that one a little bit more? I think I get what you're saying, but yeah. Um. Well, in order in order to 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 not repeat, I guess um, the same mistakes, mm -hmm. we must study what has worked, what hasn't worked, learn from history, learn from mistakes, and in order to move forward and be better. Yeah, progress as a as a as a country, a community. So anybody else? Oh, I see some things in the chat. To keep democracy strong for the next generation, and somebody loved that comment. Another thing in the chat, because one of the most important purposes of public education is to create educated citizens. And that's actually the purpose of social studies is, is to help, oh, to teach the background knowledge important for, ooh, ooh, that's really great, yeah. To teach the background knowledge important for literacy and to apply literacy skills and to build empathy, yes. All those different things. And so social studies was created to um, help build that type of citizen that a community or a country for us that the United States wanted. It was, it was for citizenship, that is the purpose. And so I just wanna go over, and this was shown in a Board of Ed um, presentation. It's a timeline for our curriculum development for elementary social studies revisions. The state of Maryland revised its curriculum um, and so what we're trying to do is to align our curriculum to the state frameworks. We're starting that with grades four and five implementation um, revisions for next school year. And then the following school year, the 2024-25 school year, we will implement grades two and three. And then that following school year, 2025 to 2026, we're gonna implement kindergarten and first grade. Curriculum. I do want to say that we will be writing, MCPS will be writing the curriculum for um, the curriculum for grades three through four, but we will purchase, we plan on purchasing for K to two. So we'll write three to four, but we will be purchasing K to two. That is the plan. And so I want to go over some of the big shifts that um, of why. Um, 
M um, the MS MSDE changed its curriculum, but also why we need to change our curriculum in elementary as well. And what we're in, trying to do in particular with the grades four and five. So one of the major things is that there is now a state assessment, um, the MCAP exam for social studies in grade eight. And that's a US history um, curriculum, the, the first part of US history. But what we need is for our elementary students to come into middle school with, a, with more background knowledge or with um, knowing how to apply what we call social studies um, skills or historical thinking skills. We need students to be a bit more ready when they're coming into middle school um, to help build, for, build up the knowledge and their capacity to do well on that MCAP social studies aid exam. So we're trying to get more alignment. And so before I want, before I move on, um, and I think I had this slide out of order. It should have been before the other one, but it's okay. So forgive me on that one. Let's, let's talk a little bit about this. What are the characteristics, the experiences and abilities you want MCPS students to have when they leave elementary school? What are the characteristics, experiences and abilities you want MCPS students to have when they leave elementary school? And once again, you can, um, we're a small, we're not that big of a group. So let's, we can unmute or put it in a chat and just feel free to, to start whoever wants to go first or place it in the chat. I'll, I'll wait in. Um, I would like students to experience having a debate mm. about an issue they care about. Okay. A debate. Somebody else wrote, thank you, confidence. Okay. Can you explain? I guess I should say, so. Oh, oh, go ahead. I just, I guess I should say respectful debate. <laughs> respectful oh, <God>. and civil <laughs> debate. <laughs> Dialogue, yeah, Respect, respectful debate, got you. <laughs> gotcha. And also I hear collaboration, confidence, to know the proper structures of writing, knowledge to be able to keep up in middle school. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Like what are, what are your dreams for kids? What do you want? What's that well-rounded student look like? And this is in general. This doesn't have to just be tied to social studies. Critical thinking. Oh, to be excited about learning each day and reading from the chat. Responsibility and accountability. Hmm. Curiosity, love of learning. Yeah. To know to how to- experience. Oh, go, go on, Catherine. I'll read the next one after you. I was thinking about relevance to experience mm -hmm. the to experience the sense that what they're learning at school is relevant to their lives. They know why they can apply. They can see it. Relevance extremely important. In fact, brain research says that that is one of the things that helps people to learn is to be able to understand the why of it. Why it's important. To know how to listen, to question, to think about complexity and nuance, Ooh, and hold conflicting perspectives in tandem. Love that, Leslie. And to know how <laughs> to know how to fact check and determine the truth. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, and the, the next one, let's see, to know how, okay, I did that one. And to <laughs> and to cite, don't plagiarize. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as as you, as I just asked you what you want students to leave elementary school like I asked the social studies team the same thing like what do we want what what are those experiences who are we trying to help build or, or encourage um and in, in the way that they grow into a human being what 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 do we want and so I'm going to be sharing with you more of the shifts in social studies um, that will show you, how we're prioritizing some of those things. 
All right. So, um, so some things we don't have control over. Okay. So for instance, the, 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 um, MSDE sets the frameworks and then what we do, they create, they create the content for the frameworks. And then what we do is, um, figure out how does this look like in our county? And we can add two things. Like for instance, I'll tell you how things that we have added in. Um, but the, the core content, the, the subject matter is set by the state. So in this case, and this is a huge paradigm shift for grades four and five. Currently, each quarter in grades four or five, four and five, really K to five, um, each quarter focuses on a standard in social studies, one of the five standards. Well, there's six standards, but it focuses on one of five. Um, the standards in social studies, there's um, civics or government, history, economics, peoples of the nation and world, which is like culture and um, geography. And so the difference in grades four and five for next year is that we're not, and the state has not organized the content that way. So now, um, oh, let's see, just wanna note that something in, is going on with the chat, but last two comments that were, okay. Oh, thank you, thank you, thanks. Sorry, I don't know. It looks like it's coming from me, but I didn't actually type those. So I oh wow! <laughs> I really. <laughs> I hope it's just Audra logging in in the same account. Like, uh, all these great ideas. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I um, mean, I agree with them. They're just they were not from me. They're not for you. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, the now grades four and five will become like a mini M I N I survey U.S. history survey course. It's gonna be chronological for both grades. So grades, um, grade four will go from pre-colonialism to articles of, of confederation. It'll go through the American Revolution, the articles of confederation. Fifth grade, there's like a lesson or two that's like the bridge between fourth and fifth that will start reviewing kind of where they left off at the end of the year with the articles of confederation. And it will go to present day. There's one caveat, however, the last unit um, goes from like 1900 to present day, but it's not about big historical events per se. It's like different things that people have done to try to make this, um, make, make the United States a more perfect union. So it's, it's more thematic about how people have worked together or used the government structures to um, challenge inequities in society. That's kind of what that, that last unit is. But up until 1900, it is totally chronological with regular, you know, the regular historical events that everyone studies. All right, so MSCE has national content and state content. What we are adding when we can is local content. So we're trying to identify like how can we include more learning about what life was like in the past in Montgomery County. The state has also included more diverse perspectives in the curriculum, a lot more diverse perspectives. And we um, locally have added even more. So um, we have, for, for instance, um, we are adding in, um, and you may have, I don't know if any of you have attended a meeting before or read anything, but we're adding in the narratives or the experiences of Jewish Americans in U.S. history. Um, and then we will be having conversations, and I'll get to this a little bit later, conversations about anti-Semitism in the past and what it looks like today to contextualize it. We are adding in um, more Asian history. In fact, we have, um, there's a, a organization that is helping to create um, a graphic novel that we will use part of to teach about um, Japanese imprisonment camps in America and how people fought for more, you know, for um, an apology from the United States or how it was, it was discrimination and oppression. Um, and then to, to launch and continue to talk about what present day anti-Asian hate looks like and how people have fought it. 
So um, we are really trying to, and another example um, is Islamophobia, right? Like, so for instance, when we study slavery in America, 10 to 15% of enslaved people or captured Africans brought to America were Muslim. So that will give us an opportunity to talk about what was it like to be Muslim in America in the 16, 17, 1800s, really 17, 1800s. And then um, how they faced, they faced discrimination. They could not practice their religion openly. So we will be able to have a discussion about what Islamophobia is and then zero out today as well. Um, or discrimination at that time and to Islamophobia today. So we're trying to identify diverse perspectives to be and as well as zero out to say, what are the, the experiences of that group like today or how people are um, continuing to fight for a more perfect union to address their needs. All right, so here are a few um, sample objectives where you can um, see in grade four examples of diverse perspectives. Is anybody on the phone still? Or because I don't know if I need to read them out loud. Uh, yes, please, that helps. Okay, I can't um, see very well, thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh, no problem. All right, so an example in unit one for grade four, analyze how the race, class, gender, and religion of those in the colonies impacted their level of freedom. Another example in unit two, Explain how American Indians resisted colonization, slavery, and assimilation. Example three and unit three, describe how free and enslaved Black people preserved and developed aspects of their culture in the colonies. And in unit four, explain how various groups, regardless of gender identity, responded to the American Revolution. And now I want to go to five grade five examples in unit one, identify the key concepts within the Bill of Rights and explore how they impacted different groups of people. In unit two, describe the various motives for westward expansion and how American Indian and Hispanic people responded to it. So it's really gonna be primarily like Mexican, um, Mexicans responded to it because it's gonna be Mexico. Unit three, Explain how African-Americans and their allies fought against Black codes and Jim Crow laws that limited African-American citizenship. And in Unit 4, explain how civil rights organizations and their allies contributed to the advancement of civil rights for all people. Any questions before I move on or any comments before I move on? Oh, Evelyn? Sure. Um, just some of the examples, they sounded um, like negative, I guess, right? Like, so I'm just going to take Asian American history, right? Um, are you also trying to incorporate like positive examples, yeah. like, you know, Chinese workers working on building a nation's railways? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And in fact, when we do westward expansion and we're talking, um, and we're talking about the ethnic enclaves with the with immigration of Chinese to America in the West, we're actually going to spend time in just learning about how people recreated a sense of home. How did they um, how did they live in America? How did they continue to preserve their culture in America? So that is part of it. So it's not just oppression. We are looking at how, um, like for instance, in this example. In unit three for grade four, describe how free and enslaved black people preserved and developed aspects of their culture in the colonies. It's not just staunched in the negative experiences of slavery and total discrimination. So we are um, highlighting, and even in this one, explain how American Indians resisted colonization, slavery, and assimilation. This is really about the preservation of their culture. That's what that is about. It's not just, you know people took over and they killed them. It's, it's, it's trying to create a narrative in students' um, minds about how people 
um, work to continue to, to thrive and to exist in who they are, those were. And, um, and earlier in the year when we met that one time, um, I, I think we talked a little bit about fine arts. Um, is there, has there been any discussion at all about incorporating any kind of linkages between the fine arts? And the Unfortunately, we have not been able to do that. No. Okay. That would be great. I mean, I Dream World, like, yeah, that would be great, yeah. but it's unfortunately. Okay. Um, and they're, I know they're doing their own ABR work, but that, that would be another area. Um, likewise, I think it would be interesting to, um, maybe not in these units yet, but as you move in, further along in history to, um, you know, innovation periods, like maybe coordinate with science. You know, the, I know that um, the science department's doing a lot about incorporating stories of um, diverse scientists and innovators and that might be kind of that's history too right history of science so that might be kind of yeah and so when we're yeah and when we're also looking at the history of science for instance we're looking at um like especially grade three uh I can speak to grade three as a perfect example for that we're looking at like environmental science environmental literacy where they'll be learning about Rachel Carson so when I'm talking about how do you localize it it's that way and I also want to just also say that a lot of this will not just be focused on, um, except for, I know I gave the example of Rachel Carson, but it's looking at groups of people and not just single individuals as well. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final question is, you mentioned that um, the curriculum for, I think you said K through two would be purchased. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be done in conjunction with any new ELA curriculum purchases? not in conjunction because we have our Maryland um, framework that we're looking at as well. Okay, but are are you working with the ELA folks just because again, and I'm learning from the science you're reading folks, <laughs> the idea that, you know, that this background knowledge is so important for developing reading comprehension. Is there, how, how are you guys working with the ELA group? And I'm gonna get to that part too. So if you're asking about whether or not our curriculum will align with their curriculum, Unfortunately, the answer is not, it's not going to be 100%. What we are doing is share, what, we, what I've done is share our frameworks. I got to make sure I know I was supposed to share the frameworks. I can't remember if I actually pressed send on those. So, but we have talked about sharing the framework so that they get, they can identify potential touch points or text that will support what students are learning in social studies. Because they have a, they have purchased from a national vendor and this is very specific to Maryland and even the local history of Montgomery County. So there's no national vendor that's gonna automatically align to Maryland. In fact, that is why we couldn't purchase is because there's no, you know, we didn't have for everything we wanted to do in the curriculum, there was no national vendor that, that would be able to do everything we were wanting to do. Got it, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else before I move on? Okay. So this is something that is local. This is not from the state of Maryland, but this is something that we're doing that we're holding as um, being extremely important for the development of our students. We are integrating Learning for Justice, which was formerly um, teaching tolerance. Learning for Justice is under the Southern Poverty Law Center. They have something called the social justice standards, and there are four standards, identity, diversity, justice, and action. Our grades four and five curriculum curricula will align to the standards. So for each unit, we'll have four units for each grade, one a marking period. Each marking period will highlight and focus on one of the four um, standards. And so I wanna just share with you a few of the standards so you can understand kind of the thinking that we're trying to get kids to be able to do and to embody. So for instance, when we're looking at identity and I'll read this aloud for you all too. Students will develop language and historical and cultural knowledge that affirm and accurately describe their membership in multiple identity groups. Students will express pride, confidence, and healthy self-esteem without denying the value and dignity of other people. So I highlighted those two. There are others, but I've just selected a, a couple. For diversity, here are the two examples that I pulled out or two indicators that I pulled out of several. 
Students will respectfully express curiosity about the history and lived experiences of others and will exchange ideas and beliefs in an open-minded way. Students will examine diversity in social, cultural, political, and historical contexts rather than in ways that are superficial or oversimplified. For justice, I couldn't decide on two, so I picked three. <laughs> so here are the, two, the three. Students will recognize stereotypes and relate to people as individuals rather than representatives of groups. Students will recognize unfairness on the individual level, such as um, AG bias speech, and injustice at the institutional or systemic level, such as discrimination. Students will analyze the harmful impact of bias and injustice on the world historically and today. And then once again, I couldn't just pick two, so I selected three examples for action indicators. Students will recognize their own responsibility to stand up to exclusion, prejudice, and injustice. Students will speak up with courage and respect when they or someone else has been hurt or wronged by bias. Students will make principal decisions about when and how to take a stand against bias and injustice in their everyday lives and will do so despite negative peer or group pressure. Any comments before I move on from that, from the social justice standards? So let me just say the way that we're highlighting the social justice standards is that we have questions that are driving kids thinking as they analyze a historical and think about a historical event and then to also think about their lives today. It's through the questioning and the types of discussions that are, um, that are gonna be had in the classroom. Any questions or comments about that? Um, I'm sorry, I, I have a question. I might not have heard very well, um, but I'm just thinking about um, like the social emotional parts that come into this, like now, especially with gun violence considerations and the anxiety. And so, I mean, I mean first of all, I'm just so happy to see all of this extra justice lens. And so it's really feels like an empowering um, feeling that's, I, I think, a sense of empowerment that students are going to get. And so then I'm just wondering how, when some of the justice issues come up that involve a lot of violence that's current in our country now, the way that, um, the way that MCPS is considering that. I know that's like a broader piece of it, but because this is like such a current moment where it's, you know, particularly something we're all thinking about and and it's bound to come up in the in the um, discussions around justice. So are you asking like specifically about like gun violence? I will say that we haven't really thought about how to tackle or even think about the about gun violence, but we have talked about other acts. Are there like, um, do you have any suggestions or what, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm just not sure how much it's um, being addressed in the classroom when we're thinking about justice and their, the current situation of gun violence and threats. And so I, I think, you know, a lot of times either families are having discussions about it or kids are hearing about it in the news. And so when we're talking about justice and, and that we know that kids are getting informed about um, increase in mass shootings, if there's a way MPS is thinking about conversations around justice that are involving this violence and the social emotional needs around these conversations. What, I mean, that, that goes with other forms of um, or other discussions around justice, but there's a lot of, you know, um, emotional charge and trauma right now, heightened concern, concern, and there has been for a few years, but it just seems to, you know, be, be um, increasing and just curious about if this is, if, if, if MCPS is thinking about ways to also be thinking about the social emotional needs and the conversations around, uh, around justice issues and particularly those that are especially violent. Well, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll be honest, we have, I've not thought about adding conversations around gun violence. I, I will have to talk to um, 
like our counselors and school psychologists to find out like age appropriateness with for things like that for conversations like that um but i but for other forms of hate we we are um including those um but i have to talk more learn more about about that aspect um evelyn um sure and so you know my theme always is um, especially in elementary where there's really one or two teachers doing all of these different curriculum is like making it more cohesive <laughs> because there's a lot of overlap often between different areas. And so um, just to pull, kind of jump off of what Deb Deborah was talking about, um, you know, we have restorative practices initiatives mm -hmm. and restorative justice initiatives. I feel like there's a really good opportunity here to incorporate some of that in this terrific like social justice standard um, so that it's not on top of each other, but actually, you know, being taught through some of these um, units. And then um, likewise, as you, uh, you may know, <laughs> MCCPTA board um, voted against any expansion of the leader and me social emotional curriculum, um, not finding that this was the curriculum that was appropriate for the, you know, what the needs are of our students, um, learning how to work together, um, but also, you know, leadership. This seems like actually the kind of leadership that you know we would want to teach our students to be you know to learn um and so i'm wondering you know as they're revisiting that contract um you know just i would suggest that maybe we find ways to incorporate these skills and these discussions you know in what the students are already just learning you know so if they're doing this this social studies section that it'd be just part of that learning instead of another add-on that teachers have to add on and do a little slideshow about you know <laughs> from a corporate <laughs> Corporate social emotional curriculum. Yeah. Sorry, we had had a lot. Of, we've heard a lot from parents and teachers about this. Um, and you know, it is our board position that we don't think it should be expanded. But it seems like with all that funding that might be saved, um, and time that we could use that for things like like this, which actually do also teach those skills. Yes, and we we thank you for that. We actually met with um. Dr. Karen Cruz and Dr. Christina Connolly, I forgot her new last name, it's hyphenated, but it's another C. <laughs> so I forget her new last name. Um, about the expectations for teaching social emotional learning in this school day for elementary. And um, they did express and share that it is their hope that um, social and emotional learning could be integrated, should be integrated in the curriculum. So what we have to do and what we are in the process of doing is trying to elevate where that is in the curriculum. Like for instance, even math, math is incorporated or has incorporated social and emotional learning in their lessons as well. So we're trying to um, make sure that people, that everyone knows that to, to possibly hopefully get some more alignment and that this could be an option to expand conversations you know, like in a circle time or something from what they're learning. But we have begun that discussion to elevate that. That's great, yeah. So it just seems like this would, this would be something great to like, you know, to learn how to, how do we talk about difficult subjects? How do we deal with conflict? Mm -hmm. you know, how do we feel hurt and yet also express that in a way that's, you know, that's healthy, right? Right. <laughs> um, how do we deal with the hurts that are imposed upon us and turn that into action, you know, um, yeah. while also being respectful of the fact that like we have experienced hurt and harm. Right. And and I think too, what I'm just thinking, what I know is probably going to happen. Kids are going to want to continue to talk. Social studies is going to be done and over with the block and kids are going to want to continue to talk, talk and grapple and think. So I do hope that, um, that the conversations continue. Absolutely. Yes, if I can just add, last night, the MCCPTA DI committee hosted uh, or partnered with hosting an event with that restorative justice unit of MCPS. And um, we did record the meeting for those who couldn't come to that hybrid event. And I'm really sorry for the background noise. I'm trying to get away from it. Oh, we can't hear <laughs> but, um, it. Oh, okay, good. Um, but so we, yeah, we recorded it and we're just waiting for permission to share that recording. So it's really informative about what MCPS is doing in, um, with implementation of restorative justice practices or the approach. So yeah, Evelyn, like I would say right on with thinking about the application of those practices in a um, lesson around justice, you know, just by 
having that climate be building in the system throughout all the schools and classrooms in these coming years, um, it seems like a really, it is, it is a really great practice to be able to open up and share about how this is landing on folks, right? Beyond just the intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that we're all learning a lot more about how this is rolling out in MCPS and there's an opportunity for thinking more about that together once we can share the recording. I thank you, I appreciate that, thank you. Leslie? Hi. Um, so I think all of this is is wonderful. These standards are are wonderful um, and are very informative about how, to me about how we can sort of formalize language um, around this work. And in my own school, I think it's just it's fabulous. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about is how um, county resources um, that are sort of part, are working on this at other levels can support um, teachers and your department. I work for the, um, I work with the uh, Montgomery County Lynching Memorial um, mm -hmm. Group and um, Button Farm and mm -hmm. Sandy Slave, Spring Slave Museum. Um, just our county has a number of of resources, and I know that they would want to be available and on standby um, for anything that teachers needed as they were sort of rolling this out. Anything schools needed, um, and so just thinking through how to you know inform our organizations that you know these moves are being made in social studies and to be prepared. To, to meet the needs of, of teachers and schools as we're moving forward and provide any resources or additional, just anything um, to, to teachers as they're, they're implementing these changes. Thanks, Leslie, for that. I actually um, represent Montgomery County Public Schools on the Montgomery County Commission for Remembrance and Reconciliation. And I have not, we have partnered with all of those people, especially for our Remembrance and Reconciliation um, Month lessons. We deeply partnered with them to help pull those off and to get um, background knowledge and resources. But what I haven't thought, which I love what you're talking about, is to, I'm just playing in my head because it's going to be needed, um, how to curate maybe like professional learning that maybe some of these organizations and, and people like Tony at Button Farm or somebody could just do a session where they're, they're saying drop in and come learn this history. Thank you, I wrote that down. That's a great one. And it's free. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Any other questions before I move on? Um, just one one mm -hmm. final note. I again I think, and this sort of goes with what Deborah and I was saying too. Um, and the blog socialized blog. I do think some discussion should be had that you're dropping, like if you're dropping something like I've heard this from parents talking about the Holocaust or slavery, like students will have a lot of feelings and just like making sure there's time and space to handle that thoughtfully, you know, because people will have a lot of feelings in that classroom. And I've heard concerns from parents about like, like how is this being done in the classroom? Thank you for that. I just wrote that down. And not only that, I'm just thinking that this is coming up, but I'm also thinking like we did for Remembrance and Reconciliation Month lessons, what are some tips for helping your kids to debrief or to talk? about these topics. That's a that's a great one for art art history. Thank you. We'll make sure we can get that done. Thanks. Anything else before I move on to the next one? All right, so this one is, I'm gonna say that this slide is, we had already planned on trying to help kids connect current day to the historical events that, they were, that they're studying or they're gonna study. But um, I will be honest, the, the rise in anti-Semitism that we've experienced in our county has greatly kind of shaped even more of how we can do this and um, besides just saying, okay, here's this historical event or whatever. So what, what we're doing, intentionally doing, and we're doing this for, element, for the grades four and five, we're doing it for grade six and grade 10 as well. We are, it's not creating a new lesson. It's creating questions and discussions around identifying, if you're studying a historical event, who were the bystanders in that historical event? 
who are the upstanders? And then talking about, and then to zero out to today and say, okay, let's take our current day, current day. Where do you see examples of discrimination, harm, hurt to others? Who are the bystanders? Who are upstanders? Where are you on that continuum? How do you become an upstander? What are tips for doing it? And we're gonna be doing that throughout the year. So the goal is to help students to not just that, that action piece for social, the social justice standards, we wanna be able to give them the tips and the strategies to help them to become, the, uh, become upstanders so that they can stop another kid or they can speak up if they're hearing, hearing a conversation. Um, so that is something that we are doing, um, which I will say became like a goal in this spring. So one of the benefits of writing the curriculum is that we can say, you know, hold up, this is this is where we are, this is what we need to do, and we're going to do it. If we have if we purchase a curriculum, it's harder to do in that instance. So this is one of the benefits. Any questions before I move on or, or statements? All right, so remember when I talked about five of the social, I mean, the social studies skills, I mean, standards, the history, geography, um, uh, economics, those five. There are actually six standards in Maryland for social studies. The sixth one is skills. And our secondary um, curricula has had those standards, our curriculum has, has, the, has had those standards for years, but those standards were never moved down to elementary. So um, we're trying to create that alignment and to get students to practice social study skills. They're basically also literacy and historical thinking skills as they learn history. And so um, the four that we're focusing on, and I wanna just say close reading really is, it's a literacy skill, right? But sourcing, sourcing is where you are picking apart, like, what do you know about this author? How credible is this author? When, would, when did they write it? Why did they write it? What's the, who, what's the audience? Who are they writing this for? Can they identify bias in their writing? Corroboration, excuse me. They'll be looking at documents and saying, okay, how do these two things support um, the, um, a, an understanding of this event? Where is their conflict? Um, is one maybe unreliable or what do they corroborate? Like, is, does somebody just make something up? They're gonna compare documents against, them, against each other. And then contextualization, understanding what's going on, the background, the time period that might influence what somebody's writing or saying or thinking. So understanding the context of, of um, a historical source to be able to understand that source better. And so to be able to do that, kids will be analyzing and using primary sources a lot. So the idea of how the, my dream world of how social studies is, it's going to be done. Well, social studies should be done through inquiry. There should be some time to build basic background knowledge about a historical event. But to be able to understand those diverse perspectives and how people experience that event, students should be analyzing primary and secondary sources to come to a conclusion. And so that is going to be a big difference from the current and the new curriculum coming out. And so to do that, um, to think about it, and I think, I think it was you, Evelyn, or somebody wrote in the chat about the literacy, um, like promotion or whatever, but I do want to like have a quick discussion about how you think the revised social studies grades four and five curricula will support um, literacy development, if, especially through those social studies skills. And anybody can unmute. Um, I'll, I'll just start off. Maybe you will be a little less shy. Um, I mean, so for me, I've been sort of learning a lot more about the science of reading. And so 
I think all of this content um, and really digging into content and the research are ways to not only apply literacy skills um, in their reading and writing, um, but also to learn background information that will help them understand things when they're like in, on the reading comprehension piece. And I'm far from a literacy expert, but I'm told <laughs> by other folks in our committee how important this is. Um, and it's based on the newest um, evidence on how you know students learn and develop their reading comprehension skills. Um, I have to say, I really love, um, by the way, those, those original, those source documents. I do too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And I'm going to even get into a little of the research in a moment to support the literacy development, which we're talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot my last point, too. And also, I think there is a lot of research about or reading about having culturally affirming mm -hmm. materials. And so I think if students are feeling that the what they're reading and writing is culturally relevant, that they will be, you know, more engaged with it. And um, and so that will also help them in developing, you know, love of learning and really learning the skills that they will end up being tested on, but through an environment that they feel like is is really, you know, speaking to them. Um, and so, so the, the changes that you are making, I think, in the social studies curriculum are really going to be important for that aspect as well. Thank so I think you. It's all great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I'm also just thinking, so let's say you're you're even studying something that you don't where it's not about your ethnic group, right? What we're trying to do and what I've been trying to encourage even the writers to do is it's how you enter that lesson too, that you can bring yourself into it. Like so you can take a topic and, and ask students, how do you experience this concept or this topic in your personal life? Or what does this mean for you and your family? How do you live? And then you've hooked the kid to saying, this is relevant to me in my, in my life. Um, and so the, we're trying to move, like get kids like fired up. Of, 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 I get excited about stuff like this. Nobody else may not, but I'm, I get super excited of getting, of hooking kids to say, this is, even if this happened 200 years ago, the same concept we play with or interact with all the time. And so um, one thing, we know that time for social studies and element in the elementary schedule can be challenging. And so um, ELA is giving up 30 minutes of their reading block next year for grades four and five, I mean, in grades four and five only right now, um, so that we could have more time for social studies and, and science instruction. So um, I just wanna, I'm really happy and grateful that they're doing that so that we can actually, so we can have more time. Because this curriculum is not a quarter long curriculum. It's not a semester long curriculum. This curriculum is a year long curriculum. And to get to what, um, oh, sorry, Leslie, let me go back. And it looks like I'm just about to affirm something that you're saying uh, about to okay. present just because as a English teacher, as we get more into research that is coming out about reading, the building context yeah. is so important to improve actual literacy skills. So I think this is definitely moving in the right direction that that research supports as to how you actually improve reading skill by building context and understanding of, of concepts so that when these words and are coming across the page, there's actually like understanding about them. Absolutely. So you did segue me, you, say, you and Evelyn segued into this next section. <laughs> so this is exactly what you are, we're talking about. I want to first talk about um, the, Fordham, the Fordham Institute conducted a study um, and, oh, there's a question in the chat. 30 minutes of the EL block will be shifted over to social studies and science. Thought it was, no, it's only it's 30 minutes. It's not an hour. ELA block will, will be, I think, an, I think they had 120 minutes. So it'll be 90 minutes. That's per day or? Per day. Yeah. Uh, no problem. So EL, so for the Fordham Institute study, that's this first bo box right here, their studies show that when students have consistent daily social studies instruction, they do better on literacy 
exams or um, a literacy test. And there was a 15% standard deviation from schools that had consistent social studies instruction compared to those that did not. Um, and it was especially important, they saw the most growth for emerging multilingual learners, girls and students living in poverty. Natalie Wexler wrote a book called The Knowledge Gap, which is a lot of kind of some, a lot of the, 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 the science of, of reading that Leslie and Evelyn have highlighted that says that building background knowledge is essential for, for reading comprehension. So an author in her book, um, Natalie Wexler gives the example or talks about when you read a text or when students are engaging with a text on an assessment or a period, there are things that the writer assumes that the reader knows about. And so um, reading con using context clues is not gonna get the kid there. They have to have the background or contextual understanding for the term, the phrase, or the event that the author is writing about. So social studies 100% builds background and contextual understanding. It helps to build empathy for others, promotes the social behaviors, makes real world connections to learning, and it helps develop problem solving skills. And my last slide to show you or to talk about what how we're rolling this out and the supports that we're giving to teachers because we 100% understand that this is going to be a heavy lift for teachers. The amount of content, knowledge, um, and the way of thinking about social studies is different because now we're trying to move like you have the way of you think about how to teach science, you're practicing science. We want kids to practice the skill of social studies, the, the discipline of social studies. That's very different than reading per se a text that is a, like a, what people would consider a social studies text, a biography or a description of an event. We want them to actually practice and study social studies like historians do. So to help build um, the staff or teachers knowledge on how to do this, we have summer um, required training for them this summer. We'll have sessions for them before each unit, before the marking period. So before each unit to help them prepare to, to be able to teach that unit well. We will have con we are we have content videos and um, other links that provide background knowledge for the teacher to build their understanding of what it is that they're going to be learning in the lesson plans. They will have access to that. We will have monthly office hour sessions for our social studies liaisons. And then we'll have teacher drop-in sessions during the school year um, to help when any teacher has a question, but also to help prepare them if they're getting ready to teach hard history, how to how to like where where you're going, where where not to go, how you know what are the parameters, especially that are age appropriate for teaching that hard history, and how to prepare their kids to enter that learning. And on that, on that note, that's the last of my slides. And for the last couple of minutes, I can answer any questions that anybody else has as well. And I do thank you. I thank Leslie, I think she had to leave, but I, I'm, I wrote down that partnership with the local historians and organizations to help provide professional learning for, for staff as well. Uh, Sheila. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tracy. Thanks for your enthusiasm. I can feel it from <laughs> through the screen. And, you know, I'm really psyched that we have people like you at MCPS who believes in this and, you know, who, who believes in the hope of um, training our kids, uh, students to be better citizens. Um, I have a question. Um, I know this is for four and fifth graders. Um, uh -huh. Are you considering also doing this on the secondary level? Um, of course, our kids will still need to learn about how to, you know, um, responsibly react to certain situations. And again, I go back to what we're facing right now around hate and anti-Semitism, et cetera. And so I know this is fourth and fifth. Are we planning to also quickly um, try to come up with a curriculum for the secondary level? So what, that's why I was saying with the, and I'll be honest, so I'm going to just be flat out honest with you right now too. Part of this is about like capacity building as well, right? Um, and contractually, we cannot put out, 
new curriculum without professional learning tied to it. So we can't just redo a whole curriculum without teachers being paid to learn about how to teach that curriculum. But what we can do is upgrade some things, all right? So what we're doing is adding those conversations um, and discussions around upstanders and bystanders um, where, we, or where we can right now. Our goal, I have a goal anyway, as long as I'm in this position, is that as we revise curriculum, like our next major curriculum writing project um, that's gonna be coming within the next couple of years, will be grade six and seven. And so if I'm in this position, it's gonna be 100% a goal to be able to pull that social justice thread and lens into that curriculum as well. Because MSD right now is revising their frameworks for grade six and seven. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Evelyn? So one final thing, it didn't fit in anywhere else. Um, my digital balance folks will make sure I ask about this. <laughs> um, you know, as you know, our delegates assembly did pass its digital balance resolution. There is specific language, you know, making an exception for things like social studies and science, which we know, you know, we want to keep the materials up to date, you know, and not have to have like textbooks from 10 years ago and things like that. Um, but I know we earlier talked about ways of, um, and, and I, I should add too, one thing that teachers noted too, is that where they often do use digital resources is because they want to find like relevant documents and source materials that like speak to the students in their classrooms. Um, so understanding those challenges, I'm wondering, are there still ways in social studies where we can kind of still mix in a little bit more of less digital so that the students, especially at elementary school, they, you know, it's breaking up their time on the screen. So hopefully, like, so everything that we're creating, we're creating things, you know, through Google with Google Docs, a teacher can print them. Right, with, with their handouts, the teacher can print the handouts and, and pull kids away from the screen. The, mm -hmm. um, so it's not like kids are getting a slideshow or whatever and they have to do. This is like, um, if there's a sort, the teacher can print the sort. We're given the option of teacher having screen or you can print, but we, everything we're doing, like the handouts and things, a, kid, a teacher can print those things to pull or get away from everything being on the screen. Okay, I will, I will say, I mean, that does put, shift the burden, you know, to the teacher to do the printing. And I know that a lot of schools have limited budgets and the cost of paper and printing does, you know, get considered yeah. and teachers are told like, you know, try to reduce the printing. Um, Our so, class that like, I guess, cause, cause it will be, we don't have the capacity to print everything and send them to all the te all the schools. We don't, we just don't, and we don't have the but like that's not in my budget to be able to do that. And mm -hmm. we're literally creating. This, if that makes like when we're when we're creating, it's not quick. It's um, intense and deep work. Um, that's just not where we can say we're going to send this all to the print shop and they're going to print and send it to people on time. We're still making like edits even now in our unit one from things. It's just, and I don't think that's feasible on our end to be able to do that. Um, there, we have purchased some vendor supporting supplemental materials like for videos, Learn 360 for like video segments. Um, that we can embed into the curriculum. To build background knowledge, we've um, purchased something called um, Kids Discover. And so part of that, and I'll be flat out honest, one of the, the attractive things about the digital world is that it has all of the accessibility features that we have to have. It has the language, um, the translations, the chunking of text as kids read, all those adaptive feature features are there electronically whereas they would not be there if we just printed things and it would only be in that one language of English probably if we print it because we, we would be doing for an entire system and we don't have that capability. So we, um, and also we have to translate everything in French and Spanish, all of our curriculum materials because of the one-way and two-way immersion schools have to be translated in French or Spanish. So, um, it's just a very complex, that's a complex question, Evelyn, is what I'm trying to, trying to say. It's not an easy answer. 
but I do know that right now we don't have that capacity. Got it. And for the K through two, I, I would ask that you consider it as you're looking at vendors for K through two, because vendors may have better capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but I do appreciate the answer. I think it's helpful for folks who are working on this issue to understand the complexities. And, you know, we are partners in this and try to figure out some solutions. We understand that it's there are challenges and there are pros and cons. Um, and we're just trying to find ways to incorporate more, you know, time off the screen, especially for that K, those younger <laughs> years. Um, you know, um, I will add to uh, just a note, you know, I don't think this is under your department, but, um, you know, for, on I know there's some talk of virtual reality, um, sorry, virtual reality things. Oh, the um, field, like where you can do the things for the field trips. Yeah. Now that is exciting for me, like for social studies, that's totally exciting for me. It is exciting. There are a lot of uh questions I don't think it, for kids under 13 especially impacts on the eye um, and so we'd ask that before those decisions as those decisions are made that we'd be part of that conversation um, certainly for under 13 there's also a lot of privacy issues under yeah. COPPA in terms of any of those applications you know they're not really the terms of use or they're not for like oculus is not really for kids under 13 but on that kind of wonky note um, <laughs> I thank you so much Tracy this was a yeah, great absolutely presentation. I'm really glad people Excellent. get to hear about this because we've had a lot of questions on a lot of different aspects that, that are covered in your presentation. And so I hope people will, will spread the word on re watching the video because I think a lot of people have their questions answered. Okay. Um, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you just, so much. I'll just say this and then I'll, I'll end. We um, were actually hosting a session on um, understanding how we've had sessions for parents, teach, um, staff, and also one for students, but the one for students I'm going to promote on how to identify and understand how hate is being spread through social media, gaming, and popular culture. And probably by now, unfortunately, that webinar may be a capacity for registrations. A couple of days ago, we had, I think, 757 kids that have registered for it so far. Yeah, and they're in the second, it's for secondary, but they're able to get SSL hours. We had um, one for on how it was uh, for Holocaust Remembrance Day, but it was the focus was on how to become upstanders. So we're trying to figure out ways where our goal, this is our goal anyway, I get excited about this, is how do we help kids live out social studies right now in their daily lives to understand um how they interact with things that impact the world today and how they can be um, help this world get better, essentially. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And thanks thank to everyone who's, oh, Kathy, did you? Oh, oh I was just gonna say thank, huge thanks, Evelyn. And thank you, Tracy, this was Absolutely. great. Absolutely, thank you all, have a great day. Have a great day. Have a great weekend, thank thanks you. Thanks for all who joined in. Oh, I'm going to make sure I save the chat. Chat and end record.